and one of her jobs for them was to be up there and teach people about raptors. And as soon as I kind of saw her and heard her teaching, I thought, I got to get this person to the Harris Center. And after she finished that job, she went to Antioch. And we are so lucky because we were able to have her this fall as a raptor education specialist. Um, through her work at Antioch. This is her internship, one of her practicums, and she's doing incredible work and we're really grateful. And tonight she's going to um, share with you, she's a, a wonderful hawk watcher in her own right, she's going to share with you some tips if you're new to hawk watching. So Kim, thank you so much and take it away. Well, thank you, Susie. That's quite the hype up. Susie mentioned um, I'm working as an intern for the Harris Center this fall. Um, I'm doing a lot of raptor programming for them, um, including this. So welcome everybody. Uh, this is our Hawk Watching for Families webinar. It's a little different um, if last week you attended our Hawk Watching Primer webinar that was hosted by uh, Phil Brown. Um, this is going to cover a lot of the same ground, but I'm trying to kind of put my own spin on it and add in a couple more educational ideas for families who may be looking for new ways to teach their kids outside of school. So just to get started, uh, my goal for tonight is really just to introduce everyone to the process of hawk watching and then give you some tools and tips so you can make it a more immersive and enjoyable experience for your whole family. So just to start off, um, this is just something Antioch has kind of ingrained in you over the years is you always start off with an outline. So I'm going to do a quick little welcome. I'll talk about myself a little bit. We'll talk about why we watch hawks, why raptors migrate. I'll talk about my three laws of location for when you're watching hawks. Uh, we'll discuss a couple types of hawks that we see uh, here in the Monadnock region. I'll briefly go over some numbers. We'll talk about some educational opportunities and share some additional resources and we'll have time for some questions at the end. All right, just to get started, um, I just wanna ask everybody, uh, where are you joining us from tonight? So just give us like a city and a state uh, where you're logging in from, just so we can kind of see the scope of people who are joining us for this. Um, this is also from my personal curiosity. I like to see how far the Har of a reach the Harris Center has. Um, so while people are populating that, I'm just going to talk about myself a little bit. So as Susie mentioned, um, I'm a, currently a student at Antioch University, but um, I was born, raised, and educated in the great state of New York. Um, and I'm currently finishing that final semester up here in, uh, in New Hampshire at Antioch's, Antioch University, New England. Um, so I kind of picked up birding as a hobby in college and I very quickly learned that I should have picked it up much, much sooner. Um, it was kind of the uh, passion that I was missing in my life. So I've kind of very rapidly and very quickly taught myself how to be a birder and worked on building my skills and my life list. So um, as Susie mentioned, I spent about two years volunteering up at Pac Monadnock, the hawk watching spot in Peterborough. Uh, that's where I met Susie. I was a member of SCA New Hampshire Corps and we were up there um, as education specialists on the weekends, uh, teaching people about hawks, about migration, um, and acting as that kind of interface between the hawk watchers who were busy looking at the sky and the people milling around who maybe um, weren't able to approach the hawk watchers because the hawk watchers were busy. So we were kind of there to bridge that gap and talk to people about it. Um, yeah, the Harris Center asked me to be their raptor education intern this fall um, to help help them develop some new resources in this brave new era of COVID-19 that we've entered. And I happily agreed because I really did want to get out to pack and just really help out with the raptor education in any way that I could. And yeah, so you can see a photo here of me. I found this when I was putting this talk together. This is uh, from 2018. Um, to come up. All right, so uh, let's just take a quick look at the chat maybe so I can see where people are coming from. I see Nashua, Ringe, Rattleboro, Wilbraham, Haverhill, New Salem, Great Bristol, Peterborough, Madison, Morgantown, West Virginia, wow. And Clearwater, Florida, okay, great. So we've got quite a, quite a range of people here. We've kind of got the whole migration pathway on here. All right, so we're gonna move into the talk proper now. So why watch hawks? And when I get asked this question, I'm kind of like, well, why not? It's this incredible spectacle that we have the chance to bear witness to every year, twice a year, if you go out there in the spring. 
Um, there's thousands and thousands of birds that you can see, sometimes all at once, sometimes individually. There's so many different species that we can see here regularly on top of pack. They see up to 15 different species that pass through. Um, plus raptors are, have the advantage for a lot of new birders of being very large and a lot easier to pick out and a lot easier to see because they tend to be a little more slow moving than some of the smaller birds. So you can catch sight of them a little easier. You have a lot more time to spend looking at them and that really helps with your identification. They also migrate during the daytime. A lot of songbirds um, have taken to migrating uh, at night in the dark, so that makes them a lot harder to identify, but raptors prefer that daytime because they need that warm air to migrate on. And as with any migration, uh, but raptors especially, I feel like they really show the connection of our region to regions south of us. And they're, they're just this great reminder that all of, all of nature is connected and something that happens up here can affect something that is happening in Mexico or even in just our southern states and vice versa. And then also hawks are, hawks provide a really great long-term data set, especially when you've been monitoring them as long as some of these hawk watches have. And I wanted to throw this in here. Uh, this is a quote by Eric Masterson. Um, he's one of our, one of our uh, bird specialists up at the Harris Center. He's actually spent, um, he once spent an entire migration season uh, following these hawks on a bicycle. Um, and so in his wise words, um, I think it's one of the most phenomenal natural history spectacles on the planet. And he's not wrong. So we have established why we want to watch hawks migrate, but we also need to understand why they migrate. So there's a couple of, couple of simple reasons, and then there's some more complex ones. So I ran a pop-up program very recently, and I had a participant um, standing, we were standing on top of a mountain looking at hawks, and I had a participant say to me, um, you know, I never realized that hawks migrate, because aren't they still here in the wintertime? And that kind of got me thinking that, well, yeah, but not quite. So their hawks do migrate, um, but it kind of depends on the situation. So we have replacement migration is what it's called. So a lot of the hawks that we see in the wintertime are migrants that are coming from further north. So they're coming down from Canada. And this is, and then places like New Hampshire, Connecticut in the wintertime are their winter vacation, basically. That's balmier weather for them because they're coming all the way from, from Canada. Um, but then we also have some permanent hawks because in some cases uh, we have peregrines who live in cities now and there's always a fair, fairly good supply of, uh, of prey items to find in cities there. So they, they will stick around for the entire winter because as long as they can find reliable shelter and reliable food, there's no reason for them to waste the energy migrating. But for all the rest of them, there are three main reasons why they're going to be migrating. First of which is food. You know, during the winter time, there's a general lack of food because their main food sources like small mammals and insects are all either starting to hibernate for the winter time or just dying off because it's winter. Um, additionally, the winter weather, not all birds can survive well in that. It gets very cold in some areas. The, it's harder to hunt in the snow. Your prey is sometimes under the snow. So it just makes sense to go somewhere where there's no snow, where you don't have that barrier. And then also there's this part of it we don't understand, which is that they just have this instinct that just at certain points in the year, they suddenly decide that there's this, this pull that they want to go south, they have to go south. And that's something that we still don't fully understand. So a lot of our hawks that we see in this area uh, will migrate to some Southern United States states. So uh, places like Georgia or even just uh, further or like Florida, some of them do go as far as Mexico and some of them will go as far as South America. So places like Brazil, Argentina, Chile, uh, Costa Rica, places like that. And on this map I've just marked, um, so we're up in New Hampshire here at Pac Monadnock. Uh, this is Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania. It's one of the most famous hawk watching spots in the world. And then uh, Kikoldi in Costa Rica is another uh, partner organization further south. So we like to compare counts from all these different areas and, and they kind of get our hawks, you know, like a couple weeks after we do so we can see when the real pulses of migration are coming through there. So a lot of the major routes that hawks take, as you can probably tell from this very simple map, uh, they tend to follow mountain chains. And that's because hawks need that lift that's coming from mountain chains 
um, from all the warm air rising in between those mountain peaks to give them the lift that they need to sort of just carry them on south. So this means that it's actually pretty easy for you to find your own location to go hawk watching. And in a normal year, I just encourage you go to one of the count areas because that's where the educators are going to be. That's where the counters are going to be. That's where we know the most activity is going to be. But unfortunately, during COVID-19, I can't encourage people to gather in large groups. So my goal instead is to have you all kind of finding your own spots where you can go and search for hawks. So this is where the three laws of location come into play. So this was a just a simple to go searching for hawks. So first one is your view. So the view in this photo here is the view from the top of uh, Pack Monadnock. This is looking out over the north and over the north side of Pack. Uh, facing the northern sky. So you'd be looking out over this landscape here, just looking for migrating hawks and then any that pass by overhead and pass uh, behind you towards the south, you know that they're migrating. So you'd want a similar thing in whatever area you decide to go hawk watching at. So you want to be somewhere that has that nice clear field of view to the north or the northwest, um, because a lot of them might be coming uh, down from like the Hudson Bay kind of area. Um, and preferably you want to be somewhere that's very high up. You want to have a cliff or a mountainside, somewhere where you can get above the tree line, because really having that 360 view is what really makes the spectacle that much better. Because if you're standing in the middle of a forest, you might not be able to tell necessarily if the hawk is just passing overhead or if it's actually migrating overhead. All right, second is the timing. So as I've been saying, hawks need that warm rising air uh, we call that thermals in order to soar. And those don't happen all day, every day. They happen at certain times and in certain conditions. So thermals are when the air warms up enough that it starts to rise. And then there are rising currents of air that lift uh, higher and higher into the sky. So if you've ever seen a hawk flying, you've probably seen them uh, just, they just kind of look like they're soaring, like they're just kind of gliding along. Uh, they're riding a thermal. If they're not flapping very much and they're, they've just got their wings out and they're gliding, they're using as little energy as possible and they're just letting that warm air kind of lift them up into the air. Um, but so those kind of those kind of thermals, especially this time of year, aren't around until maybe about 9, 10 in the morning. Uh, that's when it starts to get really warm enough for the air to start to be displaced like that. Um, and, and usually around like two, three o'clock, uh, the thermals start to die down a little bit because that's when it starts to get colder, the air stops rising as much. Um, and timing is also important just for when migration is happening. So the best times for migration are, we're up on pack from the first day of September through mid-November usually, but some of those best times are right about now, so mid-September, um, but the entirety of this next month through mid-October, is gonna be a great time to see any kind of hawks migrating. There might still be some stragglers after that, uh, but the majority of it usually happens within this window, at least in the New England area region. If you're a little further south, like if you're in, um, so we had some people from like Connecticut, New York, you guys might be like a week or two behind us. And then when we get down to Florida, uh, you might not start seeing migrants for another couple of weeks, like three or four weeks, um, but, just, uh, that's just based on when these windows of migration are happening. All right, and so the final law of location is weather. So of course, uh, you just can't go up there any old day and expect to see thousands and thousands of hawks flying overhead. So the best time to go is when you're gonna have a day that's clear, not a ton of cloud cover. Some clouds are okay, but you don't want it to be overcast. Um, it's gotta be warm, because you need that warm air for the thermals and just, just slightly breezy, because the hawks need something to carry them. Uh, the best kind of wind that you're gonna wanna go for is wind coming from the Northwest, the North or the Northwest, because that's the kind of breeze that hawks can just ride it. They don't have to use any kind of energy to fight the wind. They can just rise up on their thermals and then shoot south on that breeze. Um, and then a good tip is if it's raining or if there's really heavy wind, you're not gonna have any migration at all. Hawks are very heavy birds, at least for at least by bird standards. It takes a lot of energy for them to fly. So if it's raining, 
uh, they're going to bed down somewhere and they're going to wait it out. Uh, they're not going to try to migrate in the rain. It's just too energy intensive for them. And likewise with the wind, you know, they might be very big, but it also takes a lot of energy to fight the wind. So if the wind is, if the wind is coming out of any direction but the northwest and it's blowing stronger than 20 miles an hour, they're not going to be migrating in that. That's just too much effort for them. So they'll be bedding down somewhere in the trees those days and just not moving very much. So those are some three, three things to consider when you're looking for your area. Now I have a brief little map here. Um, I can ask Susie to share this um, as well. This is a Google map that I put together of a couple of mountaintops in the Monadnock region that are either already have hawk counts on top of them. So Pack Monadnock is down here. This is where the hawk count is. Um, and then Putney Mountain in Vermont also does a hawk count of their own. Um, but the rest of these are just kind of smaller mountaintops. Like this one is Pitcher Mountain over in Stoddard, New Hampshire. That's the one I do my pop-up hawk watch programs on top of. Um, and they've got that nice north, northwest view, um, very clear summit so you can see in all directions. And so on the right kinds of days, these are some of the places I would recommend people check out. Um, this is at least in the uh, southwestern New Hampshire area. So I didn't do this map uh, beyond there, but there are any kind of mountaintop that matches that description would be a great place to go and look for your hawks. All right, so it can seem a little daunting, especially when your sky looks like this. Although if your sky looks like this, you're having an absolutely phenomenal day and I wouldn't worry so much about identifying every single species, mainly just taking in the spectacle because at that point, just, just be in the moment at that point. But if you're dead set on identifying everything that you see and counting everything that you see, a really good thing to do is just remember, you just gotta take it one bird at a time. And a lot of the time that you might only be seeing one or two birds at once. So let's get into some identification here. So this is my, uh, as, a, as a, not a born and bred birder, uh, this is my process for starting to identify birds that I see. And it's like anything, it takes practice, you get better at it over time. And it's a method of kind of narrowing down uh, what it could be. So you start with just a general, oh, I know that's a raptor. And you know this because of its size and, its, and what it's doing. It's, it's a large bird that's flying in the distance. But then you start to break that down a little bit and you can kind of narrow down your options until you're down to a couple of different, of different species. And then you can go from there using all the, all the clues that you've picked up. So you start with your size and shape of the bird, and we'll go in, I'll go into all these in a little more detail in a bit. This is just a diagram to help understand the process. And then you start to look at what kinds of behavior it might have. So is it soaring in these big circles? Is it like looping back and forth? Does it have a particular pattern in which it's flying? Um, is it, is it um, active, behaving in a certain way? And these are all little clues that can help you point towards a particular species. And so only then do you pull out your field, guard, your field guides and you start looking at different colors and different field marks that you can use to help identify it. Because for the most part, when you're at a hawk watch, the hawks might be miles and miles away from you. So the best you're gonna be able to make out is just a black shape like this. So you might have to base your identification almost entirely on these first two steps. So to start out with, uh, there are three main groups that we categorize our raptors into. So first we have falcons. They're very small, very streamlined. Um, and this is just a generalized silhouette of what a falcon looks like. So this is kind of like getting an, an initial impression of the bird and trying to tell yourself, okay, what shape is this bird? What size is this bird? And then you can narrow down the species from there. So with falcons, they have very pointed wings. They have this long pointed tail. Um, and then we have a group called occipiters. Occipiters are, are a type of hawk. Um, they have rounded wings and a much longer tail, um, a lot more streamlined. They also tend to be a little smaller than some of the hawks you're typically thinking of. And finally, we have buteos, which also have these nice rounded wings built for soaring. They also have this really big fan rudder-like tail. And these are the hawks that you, um, that you typically think of when you think hawk. 
there are things like red tails, things that are going to be circling and not flapping a lot. So the silhouettes are kind of your first step. So if you look at a bird that you're seeing, you immediately try to categorize it into one of these three groups. And that sets you off down this path. Now size can be tricky because um, if you're standing on top of a mountain and the bird is however many miles away from you, it sometimes can be hard to judge exactly how big it is. But this is just a good clue for some of the typical sizes that we're running with here. So something like an American kestrel, this is our smallest falcon. Um, the kestrel is going to be all the way down here. It's just slightly larger than your average uh, backyard robin. So that's a really good size scale. So, and kestrels uh, will sometimes get fairly close to you. So you can usually tell pretty quickly that it's a small bird. But in something like your red-tailed hawk, that's slightly larger than your average crow. The size scale is important just for helping, also helping you narrow down what your options are here, which kind of raptor that you're seeing. All right, so let's talk about the Budios for a moment. So again, this is the silhouette that's got those nice rounded wings built for soaring and that fan-like tail. So this is one of the larger groups that we tend to see up there. Uh, there's a lot of options in this group. and our rough-legged hawks, but I'm mainly going to be focusing on these three tonight because these are the ones that we're most likely to see in these areas. Typically up on Pac Monadnock, um, they only get maybe one, maybe two rough-legged hawks or northern harriers a year. They're a lot less, um, they're a lot less uh, plentiful than some of these other guys are, especially the broad wings. All right, for sipiters. Again, they've got that nice long tail and their rounded wings. So they're also soarers, but they move a bit faster and they're a bit smaller. So these are things like your, like your backyard hawks that you might see near your bird feeders. Um, so sharp chin hawks, Cooper's hawks, and goth hawks. So, and I'm mainly going to focus on the Sharpie tonight because um, that's the one that we tend to see most often up at PAC, um, but it's still a good um, I'm going to go through the identification process just so it, you can make sense and that way you can decide if you do see a different kind of hawk, um, figuring out whether it's a Sharpie or a Cooper's. All right, and finally you have your falcons. Got that long tail and those pointed wingtips and we have three kinds of falcons in the northeast. We have our tiny little American kestrel, our Merlin and our peregrine falcon. And so for this, this group, I'm mainly going to focus on the Merlin because they're one of the ones that we also see at pack a lot. And Merlins are very, very fun birds, I think, because they have a really great personality. All right. And so, of course, there are a couple other migrating raptors that don't fall into this identification category, but they're kind of so different that immediately from your first step, you'll kind of realize that you're not looking at one of those three groups. You're looking at one of these other ones. And so those are things like your turkey vulture, your bald eagle, um, and your osprey. They are just so different and so outside those categories that you can kind of deviate from my identification process right at the beginning and just say to yourself, oh, okay, that's far too big or it doesn't fit any of my silhouettes, so it must be one of these. Um, and I threw the harrier up here too because the harrier is kind of in its own category. It is sort of a beautio and sort of not. It acts a lot like a beautio, but it's not exactly the right shape. Um, but harriers are typically not seen very often during hawk watches, so it's rare that you'll run into one. All right, and so flight patterns come next. Um, so once you have your shape in mind, you can start to look at the behaviors. So usually, when you're watching hawks at a hawk watch, you're taking a look at their flight patterns. You're watching how they're moving, where they're moving, and in what way they're moving. So I've highlighted two ones here. Um, so this top one here is a typical occipiter flight pattern. So you have these little dashes here, which represent wing beats, and then the long lines represent glides. So they flap a couple times and they glide. They flap a couple times and they glide. That's pretty typical occipiter behavior. Um, and then for beautio behavior, 
that's the quintessential hawk spiral that they do. It's just that constant loop that has them constantly climbing. Um, and this diagram has a couple other birds for comparison as well. So something like a crow has lots of flapping and then a bit of gliding, lots of flapping, then a bit of gliding. There's really not a set pattern to it. Um, finches have this kind of undulating flight where they're going up and down and up and down. Woodpeckers have an even deeper undulation where they they fall, they flap, they rise and they glide, they fall, they flap, and they rise and they glide. And then we have ravens who are just kind of all over the place and just seem like they're they're just flying purely because it feels good. All right, so let's get into a little bit of practice. So I'm going to go through a couple of our common species using my identification process just to show you how it works. Um, and if anybody has questions at any point or wants me to clarify anything, just type it into the chat and we can come back to it a bit later. All right, so to start off, um, we have our red-tailed hawk. So most often when you see a hawk just every day, red tails are the one that you're seeing. They're very common in much of the Northeast. They're kind of the quintessential hawk of the Northeast. They've got that very distinctive red tail um, and they've got a couple other very distinctive field marks. So to start off with this, um, if we saw this guy flying, we'd look for that Budio shape. So it's got those nice rounded wings and the fan-like tail. And of course, you'd probably immediately notice that the tail is red and that that's a pretty strong clue that this is a red tail. Uh, but there's a couple other things you can look for because the one on the left here is also a red tail, but it doesn't have that, um, that red tail yet. It hasn't quite grown into it. So a couple of things that are common across all red tails, whether they're full grown adults like this guy over here with the red tail or their first year juveniles like this one who hasn't grown into the red tail yet. Uh, one of them is this belly band that they have. Red tails always have this belly band through here. It can look a little different on each bird, um, but that's very distinctive. They've always got this lighter patch kind of right above it and the juveniles sometimes it can be a slightly different color. Um, and then the red tail of course, is very, very distinctive. So red tails are their markings on them. But if you needed to look at it a bit longer, you would definitely notice it doing that circular flight, moving upward. And at some point, if it had the red tail, you would probably flash it and you'd be able to tell what that is. All right, next up, our red-shouldered hawk. So our red-shouldered is, I like to call it the one that is not a red tail. Um, so sometimes you might see this guy and mistake it for a red tail because they can look very similar. This is an adult in full breeding plumage, so this is kind of the brightest it's ever going to be. Um, so it has that same shape. It's got those rounded wings. You can't really see it in this picture, but it's got the fanned out tail as well. Um, it also circles like a red-tailed hawk does, um, but it's slightly smaller and it pretty consistently has different colored patches on its shoulder. It's got these reddish, these nice reddish patches that show up. And then a lot of the time, the, the full grown adults at least have this reddish belly. Uh, so in some of the juveniles, it can be a little less distinguished, but they'll always have those patches on their shoulders. Right, so just a little side-by-side -side comparison of a red-shouldered immature and a red-tailed hawk immature. So these would be first year birds migrating for the first time. So once you've kind of narrowed them down, you've looked and you've decided, okay, they're beautio, they're flying in that hawk-like way, that kind of circular pattern. And they've now you're gonna to start to pull out your field guide and look at field marks. Um, so this would be a good way, these are a couple of good ways to distinguish between whether you're looking at an immature red-tailed hawk or an immature red-shouldered hawk. So the red-shouldered is gonna have much heavier breast streaking right here. So it might kind of look like a belly band, but then if you pay more attention to it, you can kind of see how the red tail has that, that pale upper breast up here. So it's got that distinctive band and then nothing above it. But with a red-shouldered, they're gonna be much heavier, uh, heavier streaking going on through there. And they'll also have these white bands in their tail that are very distinctive that separates them from the red tail, even when the red tail doesn't have its red tail. Um, and something else to look for, this might be kind of hard to see depending on how far away it is, are these kind of translucent outer wing marks on the red-shouldered hawks. So it kind of looks like, almost like a little flashy in the sunlight, um, almost, almost like, you know, a reflection that you might get off of a wristwatch. 
All right, next we have the broadwing hawk. So this one is, I like to call them the kettle king because when you see a huge group of hawks in this massive kettle, which is where there's a whole bunch of them just kind of all circling upward and upward and upward um, all together all at once, usually most of that kettle is all broadwinged hawks. So broadwings are slightly smaller than red tails, um, but they have a lot of the same behaviors. Uh, one of the main things to look for on them is, of course, their tail. Um, so they're called broad winged hawks, but their tails are really their distinctive feature. So they've constantly got this really distinctive stripe in their tail. So their breast can be very variable. It looks a lot, it looks very similar to what a red shouldered hawk might look like, a juvenile. Um, but they have this really distinctive black tail band. Even in this immature one here, it's still got this black tail band going on. Um, and they've also got uh, full grown adults will have this this distinct black color that goes all the way around their wings. So you can, it kind of looks like the ends of their wings have been dipped in black ink all the way around. But for the most part, if you see a huge, huge group of birds that's just forming this massive, massive kettle, um, first make sure they aren't vultures. And then you're pretty sure that you've got yourself a kettle of broad winged hawks right there. All right, next up is the sharp shinned hawk or the sharpie as hawk watchers like to call it for short. Um, and so this is one, I still have trouble identifying this one sometimes because a sharp shinned hawk and a Cooper's hawk look so similar. They are very, they are visually very, very similar. But there are a couple of things that you can use to tell them apart. So I found this cute little comic that I thought helped out a little bit. So it's just shows you in a cartoon form, it exaggerates some of the differences between them. Um, but some of the main ones that you want to look for in a sharp shinned hawk is, at least uh, from a visual point of view, um, they tend to have kind of a squatter head. Um, it sits like right on their shoulders, so it looks like they have absolutely no neck at all, um, as opposed to the coopers, which has a definite neck. And then their tail uh, tends to be more squarish. I say tends to be because there's always variations. Um, so that's not a perfect characteristic to look at, but compared to a Cooper's, a Cooper's tail is usually a little bit rounder. Um, something else that I found interesting about Sharpies is um, some of their behaviors are some of the best ways to tell them apart from the Cooper's. So Sharpies, I've heard them called the Beethoven bird. Um, and the reason for that is that their flapping pattern actually um, phonetically can sound like the opening notes of uh, Beethoven's fifth. So dun, 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 flap, 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 glide, flap, 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 glide. They have that kind of pattern in their flight. So if you watch them fly long enough, you might be able to pick out that particular rhythm in their flight pattern. Now you've all heard me sing on camera. Um, so yeah, Sharpies and Coopers are really, really tough to tell apart. A lot of times when you're starting out, it's fine to just call the hawk in a sipiter of some kind, um, and you'll just work on it later. So again, uh, very, very distinct, like little, little distinctive things that can help tell them apart. Mainly that squared tail on the sharp shin and the smaller head. And then on the Coopers, they've got that longer protruding head. It kind of extends past the uh, elbows of their wings and a more rounded tail. All right, now we get into the Merlin. And the Merlin is one of my favorite falcons because they're very, they're, they're, they're angry little birds and they're very fun to watch. Um, so we get a lot of Merlins on the pack and they, tend to, we can always tell that they're Merlins because they're, they love to harass anything that's flying by. So sometimes we'll have, we'll be watching a, um, a bald eagle that's migrating at pack and out of nowhere there will just be this tiny little Merlin just coming in and taking these really aggressive swipes at the bald eagle for seemingly no reason. You know, bald eagle's just minding its own business and migrating and the Merlin just takes time out of its day to, to go and harass it. Um, so behavior is a big thing for them. They're, um, like I said, they're very intense and they're very aggressive, but it's also all in their flight as well. So falcons tend to have more of a rowing action in their flight, so they don't tend to glide at all. For the most part, they have just this very rhythmic flapping that they do unless they're diving. 
So merlins kind of fly in a similar way to a dragonfly. It's they move very, they, they always have intention in where they move. Um, but if you're, if you're lucky enough to get a good look at them, here's a couple of characteristics you can look out for. They've got those very streaky breasts. Um, again, falcon shape, they've got those pointed wingtips and that tapered tail. Um, they've got that nice black cap, a very dark, like silvery gray uh, top. And they've got these white patterns on their wings that are always pretty distinctive. So again, uh, Merlins don't usually sit still long enough for you to get a good picture of them um, or a good look at them, but they're, they, you can usually tell that it's them simply from their behavior. All right, so let's get to everyone's favorite now, a bald eagle. So I've included a couple of plumage options on here because a lot of the times you're not gonna be seeing an adult in full recognizable breeding plumage. A lot of times you're seeing uh, some of the younger birds who haven't quite grown into that yet. So these are some, uh, some differences in the different years. So how to tell that you're looking at a bald eagle versus any other kind of soaring video. Usually the size is a pretty good indication because um, bald eagles are, you know, they're bigger than Canada geese, so they're usually pretty huge. Uh, again, from a distance, sometimes that can be hard to tell, but another really easy way to tell them apart is most of the beautios will have a slight V-shape to their wings. Um, they'll have their wings tilted up slightly, and eagles just hold them out nice and flat, and I realize that my camera doesn't really let me get all, the whole gesture in there, but um, eagles, um, have like almost a ruler across their their wingspan. It's like they're balancing a meter stick on their on their shoulders there. Uh, so they have very flat wings and their um, primaries, so those feathers all the way on the end, are extended um, as if you were holding your hand open. Um, and that's to help them catch more drafts. So I've struggled for years with identification of um, of what where a bald eagle is in its uh, development because bald eagles can take five years before they finally get that characteristic white tail and white head um, and in the meantime they're just flying around with some variation of black and white plumage going on that is just very confusing to look at. Um, so I've come across a couple of good indications of age um, just across several field guides and several identifications. Um, so in their first year, so if you really want to get into it and you really want to know how old the bald eagle is that you're looking at, um, a really good indication of a first year bird, so this would be a bird that hatched out of the nest uh, earlier this same year, and this is its first migration, you're going to want to look for really distinctive white patches in its kind of like its armpit area. Um, so that's a pretty strong indication of a first year. Again, there's a lot of variation in this. Um, but those white patches are pretty typical of first year birds. They also have these very distinctive um, white stripes that go kind of from those, those patches in there all the way out towards their wingtips. And then second through fourth years gets a little more confusing. And if you really want to get into it, there are some good field guides out there that have very, they kind of break it down year by year. So you can tell um, whether it's a second year, a third year, a fourth year, uh, purely based on its plumage. Um, but I found that generally they get more and more modeled as they enter their second year. Um, so they, their feather patterns tend to get uh, dirtier almost in a way. It's like there's more, there's a lot more variation in them. Um, and another semi rule that I came across was that there's a very white belly um, in third year birds that around their third year, they tend to turn mostly white, which I found kind of ironic is that, you know, as they're maturing, they kind of get more white before they settle into their, you know, only white head, white tail and dark body. Um, yeah, but so that's a pretty good indication of a third year bird in there. And again, bald eagles can get confusing, but just look for that, um, look for that similar beauty o shape, but then you've got your finger, your primaries, your fingers fanned out nice and wide there. And, very, very flat wingspan. So they're not holding their wings up at all. They're holding them out nice and flat and steady. All right, and finally our turkey vultures. So our turkey vultures are a special bird. I great. Um, a lot of them don't go much further south than say Georgia or Florida. Um, 
and we may get a couple that stay um, over the winter who have come down from Canada. Uh, so something that's very characteristic with them is you'll see their their very their naked head here. They have no feathers that grow on their faces, so their heads are very pink. Um, and a lot of times, if they're close enough, you can see that through binoculars very well. Um, and then they've got that same thing that the eagles do. They extend their primaries out to help them catch the drafts. Um, and theirs are kind of over exaggerated a lot. Um, you'll see that uh, very characteristic vulture V shape. So they have a very exaggerated V. So where eagles hold their wings very flat and hawks kind of have them raised slightly, vultures are a full on V here. Um, they're just making their own little angle there. And another thing that's very characteristic of vultures is you don't see them flap ever. Uh, they have mastered the art of gliding where occasionally they'll flap if they're like, you know, losing altitude or if they're taking off from somewhere. But once they get airborne, once they're where they want to be, they just kind of hold their wings up and they tilt, kind of wobble side to side. And they've found some way, some feat of evolution or years and years of instinct to just ride the thermals like that. And they can raise up and up and move all over the place without flapping once. Um, so if you watch them long enough, you can usually immediately tell that something's a vulture from miles and miles away purely because of the way that it holds its wings and the fact that it never flaps. So those were a couple of the common birds that I wanted to get through. Um, so, but mainly I just wanna reiterate to people like, don't sweat it, go out there and have fun with it. Um, it takes years and years of practice and observation. I'm still learning. I still run into birds where I can't identify what they are even if I'm staring at it for, you know, half an hour. So just start small, pick out your one bird, do what you can. If at first you can only identify them down to, uh, down to their groups, so eagle versus beautio versus occipiter versus falcon, that's fine. That's where you're starting from. All right, so just to wrap up now, i um, just gonna share some numbers. So out at Pac Monadnock, uh, we've been counting since, um, for the exact year off the top of my head, um, 74, I think, 1974. Um, and, and so there are a lot of trends in these data that have been fluctuating over time. So we can get a better idea of some of the raptor populations in New England by looking at these migration numbers over time. So I just pulled these numbers from the last three years up here just so people could get an idea of like the average number of birds that we see at Pacman Adnock. And again, this varies based on the mountain. It varies based on the weather conditions in the year. Um, but a couple thousand broadwing hawks is pretty typical. Um, just around a little under 200 bald eagles and a little over 200, 250 or so red-tailed hawks pass by Pacman and Knock within that two-month window of September to November. All right, and I did promise you all some educational opportunities, so I'm going to just talk about that real quick. So I've been, um, this is part of my job, is just brainstorming ways that families and teachers can use hawk migration as part of their lesson plan. And so this was, this was kind of where that brainstorming has led me is to some of the different ways that hawks can um, kind of inspire, inspire uh, curiosity in all these different areas. So we can see there's tons of, tons of literature about hawks, both fiction and nonfiction. Um, there are picture books, there are novels, there are beautiful memoirs. Uh, there are historical accounts of conservation efforts. Um, so there are great reading projects in hawk watching. Um, of course, there's art projects. Uh, some of these landscapes that you're looking at are just absolutely beautiful and hawks themselves are just gorgeous animals. So it's a great art opportunity for students who are really interested in that. Um, from a science and conservation perspective, it's more it's, it's that practice of long-term monitoring. So um, I was doing some research today and I actually found out that um, hawk watching data from, uh, from Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania, um, since it had been going on for so many years, um, Rachel Carson actually used it as uh, data to support her arguments in Silent Spring that DDT was killing bald eagles because she could look at the trends from at that point almost 40 years worth of data 
out of Hawk Mountain and she could see this precipitous decline in bald eagle populations after the introduction of DDT into their environment. So having this kind of data set over a long term allows us to ask those kinds of questions and see those kinds of trends. Um, and then of course you can always take that same data and do math projects with it. So um, a lot of these a lot of these data that we have from all these different Hawk Watch locations are publicly, ac publicly accessible. Um, and you can get these numbers for decades, for years, however far back you, you need to go. You can get them for many different species, many different places. And that's, you can run mathematical projects with that. You can ask how have populations changed over time? How have different species, um, how have species trends changed in relation to each other? For example, you might look at how, since bald eagles have started to come back since the 70s, um, how has that affected their main competitors, which are the ospreys? So have, have rising bald eagle populations contributed to a decline in osprey populations, or are they more evening out around each other, or, or are bald eagles just taking over entirely? These are all just questions for you and your students to explore using all these resources from hawk watches. Um, and then of course there's the more soft skills that come in here. So hawk watching is a great way to learn about patterns and build your ID skills, build your observation skills. Um, having kids pay attention to one particular thing and use that kind of deductive reasoning process to figure out what species they're looking at is a really great way to build those kind of soft skills. And then of course, um, not gonna not gonna hide it, but going out into these places is a really great way to just have this connection to nature and this healing again, because that's something we all need right now, kids especially. It's a really, really rough time for everyone. And just going out on these hikes and just watching something beautiful and awe-inspiring for a little while is something that we all need right now. All right, so just to finish up, I have a couple of other resources listed here. I always like to push Merlin because uh, Merlin is a great identification resource for people who are just starting out with bird ID. It's free, it's from the Cornell lab, it's getting smarter all the time so it can do more and more species. Um, it even tracks your species now, I found out, which is great. Um, so you can see where you've seen things and what you've seen. Um, there's uh, Jimena Hawk Migration Association of North America and Hawk Count. Um, those are some of the premier organizations who are managing these Hawk Counts and the data from them. Uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology has got a lot of great resources. Uh, they've got All About Birds, which is kind of the, the premier online field guide for any kind of bird. Um, Eastern Massachusetts Hawk Watch, New Hampshire Audubon. Uh, for some of you who aren't in New England, there are Audubon, um, local Audubon chapters everywhere. So I would encourage you to look for your local Audubon chapter and see what kind of resources they may have around raptors or around all kinds of birds. Um, Hawk Watch International, that's the main uh, umbrella organization that manages um, a lot of the data from these Hawk Watches. And then there's hawksonthewing.com, which has got some really great resources for identifying birds that are further away. Um, so they might, they have, that's where I got a lot of these tips um, for helping to identify species that are very far away from you. So I thank you all for listening tonight. Um, thank you for attending. I hope I was able to demystify this process a little bit for you and inspire you all to go out and watch some hawks on your own. So I'm going to stop my screen share and we'll take some questions. Oh, Kim, thank you so much. That was really, really fabulous. You did such a great job of um, giving people really great tools to go out and hawk watch. And um, I hope that people do take you up on practicing and starting small and trying. And I did, I wasn't sure if everybody saw in the chat, but um, I just got a report from Phil Brown today, who was hawk watching um, and counting up on pack in Peterborough, New Hampshire, and they counted over 900 hawks today. Um, so it was a really good hawk watching day. And he said that tomorrow is predicted to be another fabulous day. So I want to encourage all of you who can to cut school, cut work, take the day off, and head up to a mountain near you and hawk watch. I'm going to be doing that. Yeah. yeah, if you can't get up a mountain, um, you can also go out into an open field and um, 
you know, look around. I've had good luck in schoolyards when I hawk watch with kids. So that's really, really cool. And Kim, you gave us the gold. So thank you. Everybody is really excited about what you shared. And there are a few questions. Um, one of them is, can you tell us a little bit about Merlin? Because I'm not sure everybody knows when you say I use Merlin, what, what is that? Um, so you're talking about the app, not the bird, correct? Okay. Um, yeah, well, let me, um, I'm just going to pull it up on my phone real fast um, so I can just hold it up to the screen a little bit. Um, so Merlin is a, dashboard is a iPhone and Android app. It's a very simple um, bird identification app that was developed by the Cornell Lab. So to start off with, um, you hit start bird ID and it asks you five simple questions to help kind of, so it has a similar uh, narrowing down identification process. So it starts with where did you see the bird? So um, if you have location services enabled, you, you can just click your current location. Um, you pick the date that you saw the bird um, and it automatically does today. Uh, yeah, Miles just posted some uh, info about it in the chat as well. So that'll be an online tutorial for how to use it. Um, you can then choose size from, I don't know if you can see that with the glare, there's a handy little scale on here, a uh, size scale using common birds. So it starts with sparrows, goes up to robins, crows, and then geese. Um, so you can choose your size just kind of based off of the relative size of the bird. So I'm gonna pick something like crow sized. It gives you a color palette. You can choose three main colors for what your bird looked like. So I'm just trying to choose this so it gives me a hawk of some kind. And then it asks you about the bird's behavior. So it wants to know, was it eating at a feeder, swimming or wading, on the ground, in a tree or a bush, on a fence or a wire, or soaring or flying? So I just put in my questions. It creates a list of birds, and then it comes back with that list. And depending on what your answers put in, it gives you this uh, possibility of what it might be. So the first thing it, it brought up for the what I just did was a broadwing hawk which was kind of what I was going for. Um, yeah, and so it's, it's a good way to give yourself, kind of help narrow down that list immediately so you don't have to flip through your field guide going back and forth between six or seven different things. Instead, you have them in a handy little list right there and you can just click on it and it'll give you several photos. It'll tell you a little bit about identification characteristics to look for, different variations that you might see. So it's a very handy thing for when you're starting out. Great. Wow. What a great tip for people who haven't maybe never heard of Merlin. Um, I highly recommend it too. I use it as well and I love it. I think there's an online version of it as well, but I've never used the online version because I've always just used the app version. So yeah. you might be able to do it online if you don't have um, an iPhone or an Android phone. Yeah, great. Um, and a question that um, was asked and I've heard asked before. So these raptors make, some of them make very dangerous journeys um, to faraway places and then they get there, why do they come back? Like why, like, like if, if they can get what they need when they're there and there's no shortage of food, um, why would they come back? That's, that's a great question. Um, I don't think I'm 100% qualified to answer that, so I'm going to answer it based on what I know. Um, so based on what I know, um, it has to do with, again, that like instinctual urge that they have to come back. Um, in some cases, we think it might be that they have a memory of where they were born. Um, so they, they are trying to return back to that like similar area where they were born. Um, in some cases, it is um, a change of season because in the Southern Hemisphere, when it's um, you know, when it's uh, winter time up here, it's summer down there, and then vice versa. So they're kind of following that seasonal shift, um, either to avoid the weather or because of how their food sources are changing. Wow. Well, yeah, fascinating. Um, great and great answer. Also, um, people are wondering if you could talk a little bit about the actual mechanics to migrating. Like that's a really long journey to take. And um, you mentioned that they use those thermals, but um, like, how do they travel 9,000 miles or 4,000 miles? And how long does it take them? Um, yeah, so they travel those couple thousand miles by doing it a um, little bit at a time. Um, although on a good day, they can sometimes travel up to 200, 300 miles in the perfect conditions. Um, and yeah, so mechanic, Mechanics wise, um, basically what they're trying to do is minimize the amount of energy that they're using for the distance that they're going. 
So like I was saying, they're riding those thermals um, and then they're letting those uh, northwesterly winds push them south. So what a lot of broadwing hawks are doing when you see those massive kettles that they have is they're gaining altitude on a thermal. So they're not flapping very much. They're just kind of rising with the wind. Um, and then you'll see them once they reach a certain height, they'll just kind of point their beak towards the south and you'll see them just fall for a couple of miles because they have that height already. So they're just making like a little triangle out of it where they're, they've got their height and they've got that tailwind. So they just fall and they don't have to flap until they hit their next thermal and they do it all over again. So it's kind of, they're kind of like riding this highway of wind, uh -huh. um, trying, to, trying to flap as little as possible. Um, they do occasionally stop and hunt um, to refuel. Um, and yeah, a lot of times they rely on, you know, having the right conditions. And then, because in a good day they can go couple hundred miles. Um, uh, it's going to take them a couple of weeks to get from place to place. Um, some of them are only going, you know, maybe from like New York to Florida. Um, so for, for us, that journey might take, you know, 24 hours. Uh, for them, it's probably going to take them two to three weeks. Sound about right? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Great explanation too. And um, let me just double check. Oh, yeah. Um, Somebody was wondering if you could talk about some of the dangers that they might encounter or the roadblocks for that long distance travel. Like what, what are the things that, um, that kind of get them? And I know, I don't know if other people saw this recently in the news just the last few days, but they're finding a lot of songbirds that are dead, um, that are mi migrating, not so many raptors and, you know, they haven't quite they don't know what's causing it, but what are the dangers for raptors in this long distance migration? Uh, yeah, so there's there's a lot. Honestly, it always astounds me that so many of them survive, just given how much they have to they have to kind of dodge. Um, so people always point the fingers at wind turbines, but honest and turbines are a danger to them. But honestly, it's not as big of a danger as a lot of the other things that they face. There's maybe um, single digits worth of birds that get hit by wind turbines every year. And then when you compare that to birds that get hit by cars, get hit, like run into glass, um, eat something that's been, eat like a, a rat that's been poisoned and die from it, um, you know, just like get knocked off course by light pollution. Um, they might get knocked out of the sky flying across the Gulf of Mexico when they get hit by a hurricane. You know, there's so many things that they have to face through here. And then there's always food availability. If they have a stretch of bad weather, that can set them back a lot. Um, so yeah, they have so many challenges, but then it's just so gratifying to see that there are so many that are making that journey and so many that come back too. Okay, so when they come back, um, I know autumn, we're always about hawk migration and keep your eyes to the sky and greatest show above the earth. And it's really exciting. But when they come back in the spring, is it less of a um, kind of a window and are there kettles or broad wings forming kettles on the way back? Um, I don't, I'm not sure actually if they form kettles on the way back. I suspect that they might. Um, but the thing with spring migration is that tends to happen in, um, in this area at least. That's more of like a early March kind of time frame. So we do still have hawk counts that count them when they come back in the spring, um, but it's just a lot less inviting for anyone who's not a crazy bird person who wants to be on top of a mountain in the winter time for, you know, 12 hours. Um, yeah, so, and they tend to kind of straggle back in my understanding is, you know, you have some of the older adults who are very, um, who are very secure in their breeding, um, in, in, their, in their breeding that they like come back a little bit later in the season, but then you have the antsy first years who, you know, want to get back and see if they can get that breeding territory first. So it's, it seems a little more slapdash to me in the spring where it's a lot less of a spectacle and it's more of a kind of like gradual, um, gradual upwelling of birds, if that makes sense. Like, it's kind of like how spring slowly comes back into New England, you know, like for a while, there's just like small things, small things, and then all of a sudden it's spring. Wow, that was great. Well, Kim, thank you so much. I think we, we're just, we're a little bit over time and um, 
we have wrapped up most of our questions. So I just wanted to thank you again. That was really, really an outstanding presentation on kind of how to begin hawk watching. And if you felt like, wow, I really want to like pay more attention and I want to dig deeper into the gold that Kim gave us um, during this talk, we'll be putting this up on our YouTube channel. Miles, about how long does that usually take us to do? Uh, a week. Yeah, so you can check our YouTube channel in about a week and you'll be able to actually see this presentation again and really kind of pay attention to all the details that she gave us um, this evening. And Kim, if you were, if we were like with you at the Harris Center, we would be like clapping and cheering for you because you did such a great job and talked so much. So I'll give you one of these. Thank you very much. And thank you all of you for joining us this evening. And if you see anything spectacular or you have any questions about hawk watching, please don't hesitate to email Miles, myself, or Kim, and we'll try and um, connect you with the right answer. So thank you. And maybe we'll see some of you at some of our other programs coming up this week. So thank you and great job, Kim. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.